This is our third session on this deep and rich set of verses in Titus 2, 11 to 14. And today, I want us to focus just on verse 13. And then we'll do one more session after this on the entire structure and the flow of the argument and how this particular waiting for our blessed hope relates to this training to renounce ungodliness and this living in self-control and his giving himself for us to purify and to redeem. So how does all this fit together? That's going to be next time. So this time, let's just focus on verse 13. So Father, as we focus now on our blessed hope, open our hearts, open our minds to the multiple layers of glory and beauty and wonder that are here. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin by asking whether or not this phrase, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, is saying that Jesus Christ is God. Is that the way to read it? Our great God and Savior, namely Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. Or is it to be read, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ? That's the question. Let me make a couple of observations. And you need to know that to, to decide one way or the other doesn't mean you deny that Jesus is, is God. Because that's so clearly taught by Paul. For example, here in Colossians 1.19, in him, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Or verse 9 of chapter 2 in Colossians, in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Not to mention the passages in the Gospel of John one one in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and the word became flesh so there's no question that the apostle paul and the other writers of the new testament regarded jesus christ as very god a very god the question is is that the way to read it here i'm inclined to think that it is though I just read responsible commentators who say that it's not. Let me just give you a couple of observations. The one that seems powerful to me is that here, the previous verse, just before the unit we're looking at, verse 10 says, so that in everything they, that is the servants, may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Now here, that word soteros that I have included right here refers to God. So God, our Savior. So since that's the immediate context, and I go back and try to read that here, the appearing of the glory of our great God, I'm disinclined to separate the word Savior from God since it's so closely united to God in verse 10 and connect it only with Jesus as if we have a great God here and then a Savior, the Lord Jesus. There's nothing false about that. It's just that in this context, it seems to me that God would be taken with Savior, our great God and Savior, which then leaves you to say, There's no and here, and Jesus Christ. The Savior goes here, and then Jesus Christ becomes the designation of the God and Savior. So that's my contextual argument that you can even see in English. There are some details with the article in Greek. So I don't want you to pin your whole doctrine of the deity of Christ on this, but I'm inclined to go there and At least we can say this. Here in Matthew 16, 27, the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And 
in Matthew 25, 31, the Son of Man comes in His glory. In His glory. So, 1627, the glory of His Father, He's coming again. And Matthew 25, 31, He's coming in His own glory. Just to point out here that our blessed hope is the appearing of the glory and it's one glory, the glory of the Father and the glory of the Son, which are united, I'm suggesting, in the glory of our great God and Savior, namely Jesus Christ. However that should be taken, we know from other passages that Paul did see Jesus Christ as our God and Savior. And God himself, the Father, is also the Savior. That's my first observation. I take Jesus Christ here to be our great God and Savior. Second observation, the word hope. What is the hope in Titus? Now, we have it right here, but let's broaden out our observations, and notice at the very beginning of Titus, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life. So the hope here is the hope of eternal life. Here it is again in Titus 3, 7. Being justified by his grace, we have become heirs according to the hope of of eternal life. Now, if you go then to our text, waiting for our blessed hope, and instead of saying eternal life, he says, our hope is the appearing of glory, namely the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, putting those together for me suggests that the, the, the essence or the, the heart of eternal life is precisely we're going to see uh, this appearance of glory glory the experience of glory is the essence and the heart of eternal life and not just the effect it has on our our eyes and our heart, but the effect it has on us by transforming us, right? First John 3, 2, beloved, we're God's children now. What we will be, we will be, has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, the appearing, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So the effect of seeing the glory of Christ is going to change us, just like Paul says in, in Romans 8. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. So when he appears in his glory, we're going to be like him. That is, we're going to share in his glory. It would be a terrible thing, wouldn't it? to see the glory of Christ and remain sinful, not be purified of all our inglorious stains. But if, if we could share his glory, then we might have the capacities to enjoy his glory as we truly ought. Why is it called a blessed hope? A happy hope. This makarios means happy all hope is happy hope. I mean, there are anticipations of the future that are not happy, but we don't call them hope. So hope is intrinsically a blessed or happy state of mind and heart. So he underlines it by making it explicit. I wonder why. Here's one suggestion. He has just said the grace of God appears and like a trainer trains us to renounce deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live self-control, upright, godly lives. He will redeem us from all lawlessness 
and purify for himself a people zealous for good works. It may be that as a person is coming to Christ and is discovering that so much of his life must go, all the ungodliness must go, all the worldly desires that made him happy must go, new new capacities of self-control or sobriety and uprightness and godliness, which may not immediately connote great happiness. A zeal for good works may sound burdensome to a new believer. Being done with all the freedom we once had to go our own way instead of submit to Christ, I think he might be putting this blessedness here so that he would say, oh, oh, please, don't hear these things, this renunciation of ungodliness, this self-control, this being done with those passions, this law, this being done with lawlessness, this zeal for good works. Don't hear this as anything other than a happy condition. This is a happy hope. You experience this hope now as a happy hope. Underline that with Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access by faith into this grace, the grace that has appeared in Titus, in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is Our hope is a makarios hope, a blessed hope, a happy hope. And Paul makes explicit here that what that means for us is that right now we rejoice in in this hope, waiting for this. This is the last thing I want to observe. Waiting for it. Next time we're going to ask how this waiting relates to all the other pieces here. But right here it says that these folks, namely us Christians, training us to renounce ungodliness and who gave himself for us to redeem us us from lawlessness and to purify for himself a people zealous for good works. This this people, this us, are the people who wait. The people who love this hope. That's the way he ends Second Timothy. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all, but also to all who have loved is appearing. If you don't love the appearing of the Lord Jesus, if you don't want to see the Lord Jesus, you're probably not on the path to receive this award with Paul. The judge will award on that day the crown of righteousness. There's something wrong with our heart if we don't love the appearing of the Lord Jesus. So, the saved, the redeemed, the people of God's own possession are those who love the appearing, love the happy hope, embrace this happiness, experience this happy hope of the appearing of this great glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the very heart and essence of eternal life.